This is the last of our uh, four summer public lecture series. Uh, yeah, sorry, but, um, but, at least, but at least we give four, right? Um, and my job here, my name is Leo Plank. I'm a faculty member in Genome Sciences Department. My job is really just to introduce Mike McCoss, our speaker tonight. Um, so just a little bit about his background. Um, and I should say, I'm pretty impressed by the, the turnout here. Um, it wasn't really our plan to kind of put Mike head to head against, I think he's Barack Obama speaking at the convention <laughs> right about now too. But um, anyways, that's the way, you, I'm, I'm impressed he got, he pulled out such a big crowd. Um, so just a little bit about Mike's background. So he received his, both his bachelor's degree and his PhD in chemistry at the same place, the University of Vermont. He then moved on to Scripps University um, or Scripps Research Institute in California, where he did his postdoctoral work with John Yates, uh, who's really an expert in the application of mass spectrometry to proteins. Um, and then shortly after he, right after basically he finished his time there, we recruited him to our department here, Genome Sciences. And in fact, I think, I couldn't really remember, Mike might know, but he's, he might have to correct a couple of things that I say, but, um, but I think he was actually, he, he was the second person, the second faculty member we recruited, but he might be the first, I don't really remember exactly, right after we formed our department. So, and this is back in 2004 when Mike first joined our department. Um, so after we recruited Mike over the time, the 12 years he's been in here, he's received a number of awards, he's done really well for himself. I won't sit, I won't go through all the awards he's gotten, but I'll just mention too, in 2005, shortly after he came here, he received the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. That's a very prestigious award, only handed out to a very small number of individuals. Um, and then two, more recently, in 2015, he received the Beeman Medal from the American Academy of Mass Spectrometry. And I have to say, Mike's actually risen through the ranks really quickly. Um, he's still a young guy, as you can see. He's only been here 12 years. He's a full professor already. Um, I, he's, he's actually, he's gotten to become the point where he's actually one of the leaders in the field of mass spectrometry. I, I attended a meeting that was here in Seattle, um, and I couldn't believe how many talks his name was mentioned in, some of the things he's developed where, where he was brought up in the talk. So he's clearly had a big influence on the field of mass spectrometry. Um, it's always a little bit risky to kind of, um, describe what somebody else is doing. I, I actually did a sabbatical, a short sabbatical in Mike's lab, so I know, I feel like I know pretty well what he's doing, but he, he'll, he may have to correct me on some of this. So, but I, I think most of his work focuses on technological um, development of mass spectrometry. That's a big part of what he's interested in, and, and, he do, and he does all phases of that. I think he's interested in the instrumentation associated with mass spectrometry. I know when I was doing a sabbatical, he had a machine shop design some big device that he was sticking on the mass spectrometer to kind of improve its performance for what he's trying to do. He's also interested in sort of the um, development of the methodology for preparing samples for mass spectrometry and their fractionation. Um, and he's also interested in um, using computational tools to kind of develop the data an analysis aspect of it. And I think that's actually a really big, huge part of his lab. And based on the title of his talk tonight, um, there it is, Why Do We Care About Measuring Proteins? Um, and the panacea of robust protein um, quantification or measurement, um, I think you're gonna hear a lot about his data analysis part of it. And then before I hand the stage to Mike, I just wanna sort of say one last thing. I just want, this is mostly a reminder to you guys. We serve refreshments at the end of these talks in the, in the lobby right outside the lecture hall. So um, I'm, it's totally fine if there's time left at the end of his talk if you guys wanna ask questions. In fact, I encourage that if you guys have questions. But um, if we run short, I'm gonna be a little heavy handed in stepping in and saying, look, he'll, he's happy to talk to you guys. Mike's graciously agreed to stick around. So um, I wanna give you guys a chance to go out into the lobby and then you can actually ask him questions more informally, okay? So, um, so anyway, so that's all I had to say. And with no further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Mike to come up to the stage and take over, okay? Great. Great. Uh, well, it's uh, great to see everybody here. This is fantastic. I didn't realize I was going up against Barack Obama um, in the uh, DNC. So uh, there were a lot of kind of big buzzwords that, that Leo was talking about, things like mass spectrometry and things. I hope I, I get the, uh, across a little bit more about what these things are and what they do. And, you know, we, we think a lot about measuring proteins. Um, and we think about, uh, in fact, it's kind of strange being a department that focuses so much on DNA and nucleotides that we're, we're kind of, uh, our, our lab is kind of one of the few outliers in, in actually trying to, to, to think about measuring proteins. And I hope I get across that it's just really hard. And it's, um, we're, still, we're still not there yet. We're still kind of make, trying to make a lot of progress um, on this. So one thing I do want to point out is, uh, is I, I 
I actually looked up this um, this little blurb just before uh, 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 told me a couple days ago when I started thinking about what I was going to present, and I noticed there was this this one statement right here. So serious design for a general audience with no genetics background. I was just thinking, wow, she's. I'm relieved because I don't actually have really any genetics background. So uh, uh, so if you don't have any genetics background, I, I hope to not cover too much. Uh, <laughs> um, so it's um, my background is in uh, is in chemistry, um, and I. Uh, Kind of more of kind of a protein biochemist now and an analytical chemist, and and I'll I'll try to uh, explain a little bit about what sort of things we do. So the first couple of things is is measuring proteins in in health and disease. Um, uh, I, I you know there's been this uh, promise for a long time that measuring protein levels was going to be very important in kind of assessing your your disease status, and we absolutely know that that's true. Uh, it's just that hasn't really been that straightforward to kind of carry out. So hopefully across, I'll get across a little bit about um, what are proteins? Why do we care about measuring proteins and their levels? Um, uh, why is this so hard? Um, what is some of this, the current state of the art in measuring proteins? And uh, again, a little bit about the clinical promise, uh, if we can actually pull this off. So I think it's hard to kind of start about anything about, um, about uh, proteins unless you start to mention at least essential dogma. Uh, so if you think about most of the people in the department, they focus a lot on thinking about DNA, and, and, uh, and uh, many of them think about then the messages that it gets transcribed to. So this, this is the DNA, it's double-stranded, and then you have the RNA, it, it's single stranded, and then you have these these three bases that code for amino acids. And here we 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 represent them in 20 different letters, and I'm showing them uh, like so. And this is basically the uh, what we think about when we think about proteins. So now now what are they? So this is the structure of what we think about in amino acids, and and all amino acids, uh, all proteins are made up of of these 20 different amino acids, and and you may ask, what is uh, an amino acid? Well, this is the, the generic structure for an amino acid. There's, there's two different sides. There's a carboxy terminus, so this is an acid portion of the, of the structure. And then there's this basic portion of the structure. This is where it gets its name, amino. This is a, a nitrogen. And then you have um, these, these side chains, which we kind of denote as just being R, as being kind of a generic, um, could be any basic simple structure. So I showed you just previously these things listed as just single letter codes, but these things are very complicated molecules. They, we can link them all together, and each of these different letters has a slightly different structure. And so this is, gets pretty complicated, and this actually, these portions of these, these molecules actually um, give rise to most of the function in our bodies, right? They, they, they control the, the, they're the main working molecules within the cell. Um, and, and they also provide um, some, uh, uh, they, everything from immune response to transport of oxygen in the blood to regulating uh, glucose levels. Uh, these are definitely the, the main um, uh, working molecules that are, that are in the cell. Now, if you kind of take a zoom out of this, um, and so proteins kind of exist in all different shapes and sizes. So uh, when you think about, um, we have these things called antibodies, and, and this has this kind of this Y-type shape uh, of, of the protein. Uh, hemoglobin is a main protein that, that uh, transports um, uh, oxygen um, in, in blood, um, and it's what gives kind of blood the, the red color. It binds this heme molecule. I mean, uh, insulin is the main uh, protein. It was the first protein that was ever sequenced that the, the primary structure was derived from. And you notice here they all have very different kind of structures. And so what there is is this is a um, a like a a, a, um, a a relatively low resolution structure that's been put together, sort of orienting, sort of giving the general shape of of the individual proteins. Uh, also, another point, important point is we tend to think about these things as this very static molecules, but we know that within uh, our body they're constantly moving. They're they're not very st they're they're not static. They they kind of shift and they they are quite flexible. Uh, we we often look at these structures in kind of a frozen state. They're either without water. We look at them uh, in a in a very kind of fixed con uh, a consideration. But we do know that they they are constantly moving and they they do move and alter their shape. In in uh, in the cases where they're actually doing different jobs, um, 
In this case, uh, this is a, a, a structure of, of a protein known as cytochrome C, and it's binding another type of molecule called a heme that's in the middle of it. And so the structure of this cytochrome C is very different with and without the heme molecule. So I, I, I described the central dogma, which you have DNA going to RNA going to protein, but it's, of course, a little bit more complicated than that. So what I've done here is shown uh, a DNA where, where I've kind of color-coded the portions that will encode for proteins in red, and we call those exons. And the portions that are in gray, we kind of we call introns. And uh, you can get this different amounts of splicing, it's called, and you can have then alternative splicing to give different forms of the mRNA or the, the message. This is the messenger RNA. We call this uh, the step transcription, um, and you can have alternative splice forms of basically the same gene. Uh, and you notice here, uh, in one case, they have they've spliced in and out uh, different uh, exons. Uh, then this can undergo translation to give rise to the protein. And, and what I've done is kind of try to depict it as being unraveling the protein. Um, of course, this is all will be folded up and forming a very complicated three-dimensional structure. Uh, it gets even more complicated than this, too, because uh, each of these proteins then are often modified, and we call this post-translational modification because it's after translation. And so you can have cases where you have enzymes that will chop off pieces of the protein. Um, you'll have other ones that will put uh, these, these little markers on the protein called phosphate groups, and you'll put other ones where you have these very complicated uh, sugar uh, molecules that, that go on. Uh, proteins. Now, the, one of the reasons why uh, measuring proteins is so hard is because there's so many different complicated forms of it. So, uh, in the human genome, we have around about 25,000 genes, uh, anywhere between 20 and 25,000 genes. Uh, but if you start to look at how many different forms of of all the different proteins there are, it's estimated there's anywhere between 100,000 and a million uh, different protein forms. And we're now even just finally beginning to get some of our uh, nomenclature together. So we're, uh, our field's now calling all these different forms of the same protein sequence proteoforms. Now, I want to first give a little bit of an example, again, um, how, why this is so complicated. So, so one is you have a, we have the genome sequences um, for a lot of different organisms, and we're sequencing them for a lot of different people now. And I would say that probably within the next 10 years, the next decade, we'll probably all have our genome sequenced. Uh, but that still doesn't necessarily tell us a lot about the, how these proteins encode for a living, functioning organism, or why some people have... Uh, have, uh, um, have genes that are not functioning as well as others. So one of the things that, that, that's the complicating factor here, of course, is this post-translational modification. And we need to find ways to measure not only individual proteins, but all their individual different forms. And I'll give you one great example. And this example is actually, you'd think that this would be um, uh, quite standard, but this was actually the first example that we um, that was uh, the first protein sequence that was ever uh, derived. This was uh, uh, the sequence of insulin. Um, insulin is, is the main uh, protein that kind of regulates glucose levels uh, in the blood. And it's a relatively small protein. A lot of proteins end up being around about uh, 100,000 or 200,000, sometimes even a million uh, grams per mole. Um, and, uh, but in, in this case, this is a relatively small one. This is uh, what we call 12 kd or 12,000 grams per mole. And if you looked at just at the sequence of the gene and how it encodes it in, um, in the protein, you would list this sequence down here where each of these individual letters represents an amino acid. Uh, but it is quite a bit more complicated than that, and we've known this from the very beginning. And that is uh, in the region in red is what's known as the signal peptide. This is cleaved off when it leaves the cell. Um, and so this uh, is kind of a secretion signal. And then we have uh, three different chains. So we have an A chain, uh, a C peptide, and a B chain. And the thing that's pretty complicated about this is that the actual insulin that's in all of our blood um, is actually this one. Um, notice there is no C peptide in there. And you notice that there are what we call these disulfide bridges between the different cysteines. 
And so if this is the sequence that's derived from the genome, uh, we can't from this get to here without actually measuring this directly. Now, when uh, Fred Sanger first arrived that there was uh, insulin um, and he first started determining the sequence of insulin, one of the things that surprised him and shocked him at the beginning was that there were two N-terminal, so this on the amino side, the nitrogen side, um, uh, 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 amino acid residues, and that got him thinking that maybe there were potentially two different chains or there were sort of these parallel chains. Uh, he was able to reduce adult isulfide bonds, separate them, and he sequenced the two chains separately. I mean, so this was the first, very first protein that was the uh, sequence that was determined, and already it was very complicated to derive, and it wasn't, it wasn't something that we could derive from necessarily the genome sequence. Okay, so why do we want to measure proteins? So proteins, I already mentioned, proteins carry out the function of the cell. Uh, while the genome is relatively constant, the, the protein complement of the cell is dynamic. So uh, if you look at, you know, the, the cells that give rise to um, your, the lens proteins in your eyes, they're very different composition than that of the cells in your skin, uh, the proteins in, your, in the cells in your skin, or those that are in the, uh, the proteins in your liver or your heart. They all have slightly different functions. And, and they change depending on whether or not, as you age, they change, um, they change as under different conditions in response to stress or disease, et cetera. And so while the genome is constant, uh, the protein complement of the cell is dynamic and changes to carry out the function of the cell. So we, we know that we need to be able to understand how protein levels are changed and how they're modified under different conditions to help us understand how a cell and organism functions. So one of the things I want to kind of point out is that the genome sequences are kind of like having a parts list uh, to building a car, right? And let's say you get a parts list and you say, well, I've got spark plugs. I've got, I've got these, uh, this distributor cap. I've got, um, I've got this bolts. I've got these nuts. I've got this tire. But you have no idea how they're assembled yet into a, putting a car together, right? We can't really understand that until we actually understand what that bolt is and that what the spark plug does and understand how these different things function in order to create a working automobile. And so the same thing's true, I think, with, the, uh, with understanding how the genome encodes for, for an organism. We won't really be able to understand these things until we understand how the, uh, the functional proteins. So just to give you another uh, example of this, so if you look at here, here's a, a caterpillar and here's a butterfly, the genome sequence is identical. They're exactly the same. But what's, uh, but what's changed, of course, is the proteins that cause one to, in one state to be, um, developmental state to be this caterpillar and this other state in order to be a butterfly. So then the question becomes is, uh, what do we need to measure? So we'd like to be able to be, take a sample that contains lots of proteins. We'd like to be able to know what proteins are present in there. Uh, we'd like to know, uh, so who is, it, who is there? Uh, what, so what is it doing and how is it modified? Um, so I told you already that proteins can be modified. Uh, we want to know where in the cell and what tissues is it present. Uh, we want to know when, so how does it change over time? So if you start to look at someone um, as they age or as they get sick, you'd like to know how the levels of the protein change over time. And you'd also like to know with whom. Um, you can learn a lot by who people's friends are, who they hang out with, right? You get to know a lot about, you know, uh, personalities of, of people and different traits and, and groups and and clicks, and you get to learn, and the same thing's true with proteins. Um, if you know the function of one protein and you know that it begins to associate with these other proteins, you get to start to gain some guilt by association. So I'll kind of listed this, uh, who, what, where, when, and with whom. And the one thing that uh, kind of comes to mind, if there's millions of different proteoforms, there's basically way too many things to measure one at a time. So basic classical biochemistry often tries to measure one protein at a time, they study one protein at a time, and I think one of the things that we're trying to do, along with other people too, in this field, in this new field of proteomics, which I'll get to in a second, is we're trying to develop methods and technologies to be able to measure lots of proteins simultaneously. So this basically introduced a new term, so this term proteomics, uh, and this is basically the study of the expressed or the, um, 
uh, the translated proteins and their modifications uh, within a given uh, genome, of a ge given genome. And this is very complicated in the fact that we, that this is in every single different, every single cell that you have, there's always going to be slightly different proteomes, and at every different time, there's going to be slightly different proteomes, and under different conditions, at different age. So this is, this is a lot. Okay, so what are the complications? Uh, so when I was taking um, high school biology class, I had this very simplistic view of the cell. Um, I used to think of it as being kind of this, this, uh, this sphere that had uh, basically lots of stuff floating around in it. Um, and it wasn't until I started seeing images like this, and this is an image from Catherine Howe's lab um, uh, when she was at the University of Colorado in, in, in Denver, and uh, this is actually a three-dimensional reconstruction of the Golgi. And the Golgi is an organelle, so it's a subcompartment of the cell. Uh, and, uh, and, you, and every piece of color here is a membrane. So this is lipid. So this is basically the oily part um, uh, in a lot of samples. It's a very fatty. Um, in fact, it is fat. And, and, and these things make up compartments, and they divide different regions of the cell up. And the only thing I really want to um, uh, get across here with this, this figure is that nothing is anywhere within the cell unless there's something there to put it there. So the cell is very complicated, and uh, and I used to have this very naive thinking of, thought about this as being this this sphere with stuff floating around in it. Things aren't floating around. Things are put into certain compartments, and these compartments are basic, and all these compartments are basically touching one another, and uh, nothing's in a compartment unless there's basically a transporter or there's some sort of series of proteins that are allowed allowed that in order to get into that individual compartment. So all of this is very carefully controlled. Um, so that brings up another issue, and that is if you do look at it in a very simplistic sort of way, so I've drawn kind of a nucleus here, uh, and each of these dots here is, let's say, a protein molecule. And so if you have in sample one, um, there's the same uh, difference between sample one and sample two. There are the, exactly the same number of dots, uh, red dots. Uh, but what's different is that the number of red dots inside the nucleus or this blue portion has changed. So if you were to take the entire cell and you grind it up and you were able to measure the amount of the protein, you would say there's the same amount of protein between sample one and sample two, even though something very dramatic has actually occurred, and that is that the location of the proteins moved from one portion of the cell to another. So this is, this is a complicating factor, right? This is, we can't just measure things on the cellular level. We often may have to measure things on the subcellular level. The other thing that's, um, that's a challenge is, uh, is there's lots of different types of proteins. So uh, collagen um, is this very fibrous protein. Uh, it, um, uh, it makes up a lot of the structural components of, of our body, parts of bone, parts of um, uh, cartilage. Uh, it's the kind of the things that kind of keep a lot of sort of stability to uh, a lot of different tissues. Uh, myoglobin is a, uh, is a protein that, again, binds heme, um, uh, can transport um, uh, oxygen again. It's a very what's called a globular protein, and there are lots of proteins then that span these membranes. They span the those lipid layers I was telling you a little bit about, uh, and these are very different. So some of them um, are are not that easy to deal with. They they don't they don't all behave the same way. Um, some of these are actually are stuck in in these lipids, and one of the things that's actually um, the most hardest group to study is actually these membrane proteins. Yet, uh, there are about 25 to 30 percent of all proteins encoded by the human genome. There are 50 percent of all drug targets. So if you're taking any medication, um, uh, about half of those, those medication may, may target um, an individual uh, membrane protein. And the other thing that's important to kind of keep, uh, keep in mind is that they're insoluble in aqueous conditions. So most of the methods that we use in order to measure proteins require things to be in aqueous solution. Um, this is water solution, and uh, if, if most of these are insoluble in, in aqueous solutions, uh, then this makes them very hard to, to measure. And I'll also point out is that 90% of all our analyses are focused on soluble proteins, um, like this myoglobin type protein. Uh, and this is, uh, this is kind of an interesting challenge, right? Because we've kind of 
chosen to focus our efforts on studying types of proteins that end up being easier to measure, that we have tools to measure, and not necessarily the ones that may be the most important. And even if you look at membrane proteins, there's all different types as well. There's those that just span the membrane once. There are those that span it multiple different times. There's those that kind of form these kind of um, uh, these uh, these sort of transporters and um, and and go, th and go through it again in, in multiple different passes. There's ones that just kind of have these kind of loops through the membrane. Uh, so there are many different forms and not all of them can be treated the same and handled with one method basically to analyze them. So how are our protein mixtures of proteins analyzed in general? So if you look back, people only really began to measure lots of proteins starting in the 1970s. I know for a lot of people here who might be in high school, that sounds like an eternity away uh, ago. Uh, but it, 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 in, in the scheme of methods and, and biology and science, it actually wasn't too long ago. And so there was this person, uh, this graduate student named uh, Patrick O'Farrell, and he had this great idea um, uh, that he was going to separate proteins first by their charge. And then he was going to take those proteins separated by their charge, and then he was going to separate them by molecular weight. And this is uh, what was called two-dimensional gel electrophoresis. And it's two dimensionals because there's one dimension in uh, this isoelectric point or charge, and there's another one based on its molecular weight. So this is how big it is, and this is how much positive or negative charge it has. And the proteins basically stop when they hit a neutral, a pH that, that causes them to be a neutral charge. And one of the things you'll notice is that there's lots of dots in here, and each of these dots has a different protein. Uh, I believe this is an E. coli lysate, and this is actually the original first gel that was run in the 1970s. And the way that people had begin to, begun to thought about this is that, okay, well, we have multiple different samples. Well, maybe we can go in and, and we can see, well, you know what, some of them kind of went down of these spots, and then um, other ones uh, seem to go up. And, and this is pretty important. We're able to measure those that go down, those that go up, and, and maybe we can use this um, uh, as a way to, to kind of study proteins. And, and people did use this for a long time, and it, and it worked for, in some cases, um, incredibly well. Another thing that, that was learned was uh, that proteins, again, are very complicated. I told you already that one transcript can give rise often to many different protein forms. And so this is actually, in, uh, on the left-hand side, is you're, we're staining the gel. This is actually a, uh, an, an image from a paper that my wife published back in the, uh, in the early 1990s. And then on the left-hand side is uh, using silver stains, so it basically stains all protein. And on the right-hand side is ones that are is called an immunoblot, so only ones that are recognized uh, by this, a given type of another protein, so only ones of a specific protein sequence. And one thing that you'll notice is that there's often 10 different forms of that individual protein. Um, this is one that's in uh, Golgi. This is one in control. This is one that's treated with a drug called cyclohexamide. And then when you look in different portions of the cell, you get very different spots. So here, there are obviously this one protein has, has many different forms in, in, in the Golgi, which is a, the main uh, uh, portion of the cell that, that causes proteins to be secreted or pushed out of the cell. And then uh, this is in the, um, the cytosol, um, where uh, uh, there's, again, um, there's clearly a lot less different forms of the protein that are present there. So the idea was that you could find an individual spot that was important. You could cut this out, um, and you would then break it into pieces. So we would have enzymes that cleave at very specific uh, types of amino acids. So the most common one is an enzyme called trypsin, um, and it's and it's actually we get this from uh, often from uh, pig pancreases. Or uh, although it's, people have also been able to make it sometimes recombinantly, although not very well. And we use this enzyme because it cleaves at K and R in those sequences, or lysine and arginine. And we cleave at very specific amino acids, and then we have these different um, components. And then we use these parts, we try to sequence them, determine their sequence identities by mass spectrometry. And this helps us map these things back to the, to the genome sequence to tell us a little bit about what that sequence is, to what that protein uh, was that they, that they came from. So we then know that this maybe this spot came from X proteins uh, sequence. <laughs>
So now to, to start off with, though, I need to tell you a little bit about mass spectrometry. I told you it was kind of a comple complex uh, term. Um, now, the one, if there's one thing you kind of take home with this is that a mass spectrometer is just a very fancy way of weighing molecules. We can determine their mass. And, uh, it, but it is a very complicated instrument. Um, it's not a simple instrument. Um, it's, uh, it involves a way in which you can take molecules, you can generate, um, uh, generate gas phase ions, so we can get ions in the gas phase, not in, the, the, uh, not in solids or liquid phase, it's actually in gas phase, um, and also charged. Um, and we need them to be charged because they then will behave in a certain way um, uh, within our instrument in the vacuum system. And then we introduce them into this uh, vacuum system so there's, there's no air or very little air into it. Um, uh, in this region, and then we have a portion of the mass spectrometer which we call mass analyzer, and this is the part that actually weighs uh, the different molecules that we're measuring, and then we have a way in which we detect them, and all of this and all the different parts are controlled and run by a computer. So I would say that our, um, our lab, or what we do as, as scientists, is kind of a merger between those that are kind of engineering protein biochemistry, and computers. And, and this is uh, something that's, uh, I think, very valuable is that, that you can see that you know, people do build instruments. Um, and uh, we, we have ways in which we need to get the sample in. So this is the biochemistry. We have ways in which we uh, generate ions. That's basically physics. And then we have ways in which we, um, we measure these things. This is, again, um, sort of analytical chemistry. And then all of this, again, is controlled by computers, which is, uh, of course, involves a lot of uh, computer science and informatics. The type of instruments we have in the lab, all of them are known as tandem mass spectrometers. So uh, there's this term, tandem mass spectrometry. And, or we just abbreviate this a lot because it's a lot of words to say tandem mass spectrometry. So we just say MSMS. And in this case, we have two mass analyzers. Um, and uh, I've drawn them kind of separated in space, uh, so physically separate places, but they actually could be just in time in one physical space. So if we have a bunch of different molecules, we can select one and say, look, I only want ones of this size to go into uh, another portion uh, of the mass spectrometer, which can then undergo collisions. And then we break them into pieces and then we basically weigh those individual pieces. And so we get in the computer um, a spectrum which has a mass of charge and intensity. And the, uh, the individual pieces here that we've weighed um, end up being the weight of the individual portions that have been broken. So if we have a specific peptide, which is a peptide is just a portion of a protein, uh, we, and we, we tend to break them along these bonds right here. And so if we can weigh the portion of the peptide that contains the amino group, this nitrogen group, uh, termini, and the carboxylic acid group, we can get what's called Y ions and B ions. And then the difference between these masses tend to be the weight of these R groups. So let me just give you an example here. So let's assume you had this individual sequence. Um, we measured this mass spectrum from this individual sequence. And if you were to look at the mass, between this L and this F, so this is a leucine and a phenylalanine, you'd have two components, one that's 467 and the other one that's 792. So you'd have, you see them in the individual spectrum. If you were to break the bond right here between this H and this L, so it's histidine and leucine, you have this 353 and 905, like so. And so not that long ago, we used to sit down and we used to print out these spectra and we used to go grab a cup of coffee and we would sit there and try to interpret them one by one. Um, but it was in uh, 1994, actually, here at the University of Washington, um, there was this incredible discovery that was made and this was that you could take this individual MSMS spectra, you could have a sequence database which we can now get from the genome sequence, and we could take an individual fragmentation spectrum, which may be from a peptide of mass, a mass of charge 1069. Uh, you would look through this sequence database and say, look, give me all the amino acids that add up to this mass of, of 1069. Um, you would then generate a theoretical spectrum, assuming the bond break between every single one of these bonds. And then you would compare them using a similarity metric. We call it a cross-correlation score, but there's lots of different ways that people can come up with similarities. Um, and this then allowed us to then determine which peptide sequence was the best match of this individual uh, spectrum.
we called this a peptide spectrum match. Um, but this was extremely powerful. Um, this was back in 1994, so this was significantly before the Human Genome Projects. Um, and uh, it was one of those technologies that was way ahead of its time because it actually needed protein sequences uh, before it could actually determine the identity of the individual spectrum. So this was a case that this was a technology that really took off when we had our, uh, the human genome sequence or different organism sequences. Now I told you that basically the approach was, was to take a gel, see a spot that's changing, you'd cut it out, you'd run it by mass spectrometry, and then you'd determine the, uh, the individual uh, um, spectrum uh, like such, um, and then you'd use this to determine the peptide sequence and the protein it came from. But all of this depended on the gel in the first place. So just to give you a sense of this, uh, the problem here. So uh, if we were to look in the tube, uh, we could basically measure, we could basically see something that's uh, about 100 micrograms in the bottom of a tube. Um, once you start to get down to 10 micrograms you start, and low micrograms, you're looking at this type of stain that goes onto the gel called Kamasi stain. And then silver staining is on things that are 10 to the minus third. So this is, uh, um, this is in the nanogram type range. And then 10 to mass spectrometry is, again, um, another, uh, you know, picograms are often lower of material. So here, our, ma our mass spectrometry method is much, much more sensitive than the stains that we're using to be able to derive what, what's changing or not. So this began to be a major limitation of 2D gel-based proteomics, and so this is something that caused us to re begin to rethink things. Another limitation was, was that a lot of proteins just didn't separate by gel. So the membrane proteins I told you about, they just didn't work at all. And uh, visualization, uh, you know, the spot must be stained, so we know that that wasn't very sensitive. The dynamic range really couldn't measure the least abundant proteins and the most abundant proteins at the same time. Um, there were a lot of peptide loss in the process, and these were extremely laborious. And a lot of people used to think, well, we just got lots of students in the lab, so it's not that big of a deal. We can have them cut out all these spots and me measure them. So uh, that's, and students are relatively cheap, but, uh, but in the end, it ended up being something that still was the, uh, a, a major limiting factor that was going to be a problem that we weren't going to be able to scale. So just when we began to think that things were going okay, uh, we realized, you know, it's like riding our bike on this bike path here. It's not going to go very well. Um, so uh, it, it really began to focus, uh, cause us to think differently. And, um, and Leo mentioned that I, I trained with a person named John Yates, who actually used to be here at the University of Washington as well. Uh, you'll notice that the, uh, a lot of this history in proteomics has been derived here um, in Seattle. Um, it's a... a and so the main idea that, that he had was that you could take this protein mixture, not run a gel, you could denature it, which just means unravel it, and you break it into small pieces as a mixture. And, uh, and then what you would do is you'd take this mixture um, and you would stick it on a, on a microcapillary column. And this uh, microcapillary column would sit in front of a mass spectrometer, tandem mass spectrometer. And just to give you a sense of the scale of this is that this is on the order of about um, uh, 75 micron internal diameter. So that's actually a, a smaller than the size of a lot of people's hair, right? So this is a really small column. It's a really thin, and we actually have liquid that we're going and pushing through this. Um, and uh, what we do is we, we take our peptide mixture, we load it onto this column, and it's packed with beads. And the peptides that tend to be more hydrophilic, so those that like water more, tend to go faster. And the ones that tend to be more hydrophobic, so they don't like water, tend to be um, more like lipids more, and they're more greasy, they tend to go slower. So this is, we make this plot versus time, and I can actually just go back and do that again. And, um, uh, and so these things get put on. You notice these, the red one tends to be more hydrophilic, so it tends to go a little faster, and the blue tends to be more hydrophobic. This is interfaced on the front end of a mass spectrometer, and I've told you that we could separate these things in, in space or in time, and we put this really high voltage um, on, the, on the capillary column in the liquid, and you get this spray of liquid towards the mass spectrometer, and this eventually allows us to desolvate the uh, the peptides and ionize them, these then get trapped with using um, electric, uh, so DC, so direct current and um, oscillating current um, uh, AC uh, RF fields. Uh, and then we can trap them in a space in the gas phase. 
And then uh, we can selectively eject them from the mass spectrometer based on their mass. And we can have frequencies that allow them to become unstable, and they eventually become uh, unstable and uh, uh, exit to a detector, which then we measure the mass of charge. So we basically just weighed all the molecules that were coming off the column. Um, and then what we do is a step what we know call is data-dependent acquisition. So we say that the instrument on the computer, uh, the computer on the instrument says this is uh, this individual peptide of this mass. We want to determine the sequence of it. So we're then going to go and refill it again. Um, and, and we're now measuring all the individual peptides we're then going to eject all the ones that are not the blue ones and just keep the blue ones in, in place. And then we're going to excite them with a gas and then break them into pieces. And then we're going to measure the mass of those individual pieces. So what we're able to do now is take a mass spectrum. Uh, we can select peptides for tandem mass spectrometry on the fly. We can measure often many of these. And now what we are able to do with the latest instruments is 20 of these spectra can be determined per second. So this is really fast, right? From very minute quantities um, of material. Uh, we're talking about uh, tens of uh, thousands uh, of molecules. So it's not, it's not an enormous amount, amount of material. So we have these individual signals. We measure the individual mass of those signal peptides. We then determine these spectra which we then give rise to this, the sequence of the individual peptides. And we're doing this for 20 peptides basically per second. Uh, and, uh, and we repeat this over and over and over again um, as all the stuff comes off our column. I just want to show this a slightly different way. So basically, you have this protein mixture. You digest the peptides. You separate those peptides. You measure the mass of the peptides at each point in time. And then during the time, 20 times per second, basically, we're able to determine sequence of things coming off in real time. So this is what we call data-dependent acquisition. We collect a mass spectrum, and we sample this. And so here's a precursor mass and time. <clears throat> and we make our decisions in real time. Um, and most of these things are spent sampling the most intense signals that are coming off the column. Now, the biggest challenge we have is that these mixtures are really complicated. So if you're measuring a mass spectrum, this doesn't show up too well, but every single dot here is a different peptide. And this is a narrow region in time and a narrow region of mass. And we can take a couple slices through the data. And so if you took a slice through the data in mass, these are all things that have the same mass, but at different times. And if we take a slice through the data here, these are all things at the same time, but have different mass. And there are hundreds, if not thousands, of things that have the same mass, but different times. And there are hundreds, if not thousands, of things that come out at the same time, but have different mass. So these are very complicated. And so when I started uh, my lab here at the University of Washington, um, these are very complicated mixtures. And we began to think, well, what if we just applied it to a system that we knew was fairly important? Um, and we wanted a, a, a system that was going to be fairly controlled and something that we, we, could, uh, we could try to understand and try to interpret the results of. And we decided that we were going to focus initially on a system known as C. elegans. And there were a lot of reasons why we decided to do this. Um, so C. elegans is, uh, is a tiny, it's a multicellular organism. It's a little nematode worm. It's, a, it's about a millimeter. In, in length. It's, uh, it's really small. You basically need a, a microscope to be able to see it. But it's, uh, it's still fairly complicated. It's got a lot going on. And at the time, it was the only multicellular organism with a genome sequence to completeness. And I mean uh, this by saying that, that it was the only organism that had no gaps. There's a lot of, a lot of organisms which we say have their genome sequenced, but they, don't, they all still have a little bit of gaps in them. And also, uh, around about the same time as I started my lab, it was uh, uh, John Solston received the Nobel Prize for this. So it was, uh, he received the Nobel Prize for the complete lineage. So there's 959 somatic cells. So these are non-germline cells. Uh, that, uh, and he, they know basically where every single cell comes from, all the parent cells and all the daughter cells, and all the different stages of division and how they end up you know, functioning in different tissues. So as an organism, 
We know a lot about this to completeness. We know, um, we know the complete genome sequence. We know the complete lineage. Um, so we thought it would be a great opportunity to study this on the protein level. Uh, also, there's a lot of reasons for studying worms um, because there's a lot of things that are that we call, that we say are conserved between humans and worms. So if you're trying to think about the insulin signaling pathway, so this is one of the main pathways that's involved in, in type 2 diabetes. So we have, there's, we have, as humans, we have the insulin receptor, worms have DAP2. Uh, they have these, we have these, these proteins called uh, insulin receptor substrate proteins. Um, they have IST1. There's this PI3 kinase. We have age, uh, I mean, we have PI3 kinase. They have uh, age, age 1. But basically, you notice this pathway has very similar protein sequences between uh, and function between humans and worms. We decided that we were going to do biochemistry to fractionate it. We were going to collect a lot of data, so we collected on the order of this time uh, uh, with 6 million MSM spectra. We determined 67,000 peptide identifications and 7,000 uh, protein, uh, proteins were represented for this. So this was a lot of data, but it took about 30 days for one sample. The interesting thing here, which was again another kind of head slap and failure, was um, zero proteins were known to be involved in the insulin signaling pathway. So this was pretty depressing. I had gotten our, my first grant, NIH grant, to do this work. Um, we were going to study the insulin signaling pathway um, in worms. And we did this, uh, we spent 30 days of, of uh, time on a mass spectrometer, which is a very expensive piece of instrument, and that, that costs a lot of money. And at the time, uh, we had zero proteins that were identified and known to be involved in the insulin IGF-1 signaling pathway, which was what we were funded to study. So this began, this forced us to kind of regroup and rethink about things. Um, and uh, the big thing we, we, um, we were thought about is that, you know, this is, process is kind of like this I Love Lucy episode. Uh, this is definitely before my time, this episode, but it's, I'm sure it's been before a lot of people in this room's time. But it's basically the approach that we were using, the sample peptides, was very much like this, right? So if people have seen this episode, they notice that they're trying to keep up with these, uh, the chocolates are coming off the conveyor belt. And they just can't. And they get to the point where they're stuffing them in their mouths and down their shirts and doing everything they can to kind of hide the, the chocolates that are going passing too quickly. And this is basically this approach that we've been using to sample peptides as it comes off our HPLC column. And the mixtures are just, the peptides are just coming too fast. And the other thing that's a problem is it's kind of like going, who here has visited a foreign city? So a lot of people visit foreign cities, right? And so if, what if you, I were sort to of tell you you could only go and visit a foreign city by visiting it the tallest buildings first? So I, uh, I've been to Kyoto. It's a, it's a fantastic city in Japan. And so let's say you were told to go visit Kyoto, and you can only go to the tallest structures first. So you might go into the first building, and it would be, it'd be kind of like an office building, or maybe it's like a hotel. It would be a relatively tall structure. And, and you'd, uh, you know, it would look very similar to a lot of Western buildings uh, and a lot of buildings we have here in the United States and in Seattle. And you'd look outside the window and you'd say, well, you know, it kind of looks very similar to a lot of other cities. And you'd notice some things are different. Well, they have this high-speed train that goes through the city, which we don't have here. Uh, you have these, this uh, city surrounded by hills. It's kind of nice. And you notice some things are a little weird, like they drive on the left-hand side of the road. And, um, and, uh, but you wouldn't learn too much about the details of the city. Now, if you were down on street level, um, you would miss things like you know, these incredible shrines and, and uh, temples. And uh, you'd miss a lot of the very interesting storefronts. Um, uh, you'd miss, uh, again, different storefronts of food. Um, you'd miss the way people dressed differently. The types of things that they had uh, to eat would be different. Um, so you'd miss a lot of things uh, by going to an individual city and saying you're only allowed to go to the tall structures first. And that's basically the way we've been doing proteomics, is we've been looking at the most intense things first when we're not actually necessarily looking at the most important things. So I'm trying to make a case that you know, if we wouldn't learn much about going to Kyoto by going to the tallest structures, why would we use this approach to understand proteins? So the way that we've begun to think about this in the last five years is we should be building off of other people's knowledge. There's a lot of things that are known. So what we often do when we're going to a foreign city is you go to Google, right? And you look for things, right? You're saying, look, uh, what are the things I should go visit? And you see different 
places that you may want to go uh, consider doing. You'll maybe find a blog that someone talks about their travel experiences. Uh, if you want to figure out what sort of foods you should try in a given city, you know, are there certain, uh, you know, you you go and you uh, and you can and sample different food types. Um, so this has basically got us thinking, and other people as well, that maybe we should be doing things in a more targeted way. And this is, uh, if this approach here is data-dependent acquisition, where we select them on the fly, and this is basically we're telling the mass spectrometer to measure specific masses. So we have an individual protein sequence that we have encoded by the genome. We can predict the masses of different segments of those things called peptides, and we can then predict those masses, and we can tell the mass spectrometer only to measure the masses that we're interested in. Um, we can then measure, make it even more selective, not just the individual precursor mass, but the individual precursor and the product ion mass. This is the precursor and an individual fragment ion mass. And this becomes an extremely selective uh, uh, measurement. Uh, this gives us lots of information. We can derive the entire sequence, and we basically are guaranteed that we're not going to miss uh, an individual peptide. Basically, it's not going to go off the conveyor belt too fast. This also allows us to begin to think about measuring changes in abundance. So, so if you take an individual protein and you spike it into a complex mixture and make dilutions, well, do you want the signal changes in proportional to the actual amount that's injected? And uh, not only does it go down in this in the scale that your eye can see here, but you can blow up this portion that's in the bottom, and this is now rescaled, uh, and you can keep blowing up the bottom portion of the graph. And in general, uh, we end up having now 10 to the fourth, or four different four logs um, uh, of dynamic range. So it's 10,000 fold difference intensity from the least abundant to the most abundant signal that we can measure quantitatively. So the last little bit before I end is now that we're able to measure proteins very specifically, we can follow things basically from a Google list. Like if we have a hypothesis, we can go test the hypothesis. We can measure it. We can quantify individual ones. What are we going to be able to do with it? So one thing is, is that we'd like to be able to use proteins as molecular biomarkers. So a biomarker is an indicator of a, a particular disease state um, in, uh, um, or a state of an uh, individual organism. So previously in the old days, we would just measure things like heart rate, respiratory rate, which are still important, um, body temperature. So if you know if you have you know, a temperature, you're, you may be getting sick, uh, and blood pressure. But now we measure uh, lots of different molecular markers. So people go and they get their cholesterol measured. You get your glucose measured for as a risk factor for diabetes. There's a protein called uh, PSA or prostate-specific antigen that's a risk factor for prostate cancer. Uh, a protein called BNP is a, a marker for heart failure. And there's many, many more. And there's more that are being discovered all the time. Um, so. What we'd like to be able to do is have a panel of protein abundances that can be used for early de detection of disease, but also just managing your normal health. And so we think that this would be good uh, to be able to do this from plasma. You don't necessarily want to have a, to go into the doctor and have them sample part of your heart in order to measure things in your, uh, your, you know, your heart disease risk. You'd like to be able to measure some marker that's in your blood. And uh, plasma contains proteins uh, from every tissue in the body, so blood contains uh, proteins for any tissue in the body, and we know that a lot of cases they can be predictive of abnormalities in the cells, and it can be relatively easy to sample. Nobody likes being stuck with a needle, but in general, this is uh, a relatively easy uh, source. So there are problems still. So one is that measuring proteins in plasma is hard. Uh, so one way to think about this is a a drop of food dye in a glass of water will change the color of water, but that same drop of food dye in a swimming pool will never get noticed. So basically, we're trying to measure very dilute amounts of proteins in, uh, in a given volume. Uh, many markers are not specific to one disease or condition, so lots of proteins change when you're sick, um, but they may not be specific to what you may be sick of. Uh, these are also very difficult and expensive experiments to perform. So there's this chart um, that kind of gives you a little bit of a sense of, of what we're dealing with. And this was published in, in 2002, so this is 14 years ago. Um, uh, and, and what we've got here is a log scale. So this is uh, 10, 20, uh, you know, uh, 10, 100, you know, 1,000, et cetera, in picograms per mil. And so 
The most abundant uh, protein um, in blood is a protein known as hemoglobin. The second most is albumin, and it's uh, basically uh, um, 10 to the 10th uh, picograms per mil. And down to the uh, lowest ones are very low levels of uh, picograms per mil, so single digits, so interleukin-6 and, and uh, albumin and hemoglobin are almost 10 orders of magnitude difference in, in abundance. Now, just to give you a sense, because I can't really wrap my head around that, so this is what we call dynamic range. And this is basically uh, the distance between the Earth and the Moon, uh, is, um, and the difference between the diameter of a penny is about 10 to the 10th, two. So basically, the challenge here is basically finding something the size of the penny between um, the Earth and the Moon. And another way to look at this is that um, I think uh, a student in our lab, she came up with the other analogy, which basically said, it's basically trying to find a single E. coli or a single bacterial molecule in the, same, in the entire state of California. It's basically the same difference. And our technologies and our methods currently are like trying to find a big jumbo jet in, this, in the state of California. They're only able to measure these four logs or five logs of dynamic range, not these 10 logs of dynamic range. That, that be said, we still decided that we were going to try to measure proteins in, in blood. And if you go to the doctor, uh, there's basically this list of proteins that, what could be, that the doctor could order to measure in your blood. There's about 120 uh, proteins that, that do get measured in blood uh, quite routinely, and they're all shown here. The ones that I've shown in red are the ones that we've started to try to make uh, assays for, and there are a lot of reasons why uh, we decided to start with these ones. Mostly it's because we could get a standard for those individual proteins. So uh, these include all different uh, types of proteins with all different functions and they have all uh, potential disease relevances. So uh, we couldn't get it for a whole 120 proteins, but we can in a single um, 35 minute length of time, we can actually measure 63 of those proteins, and we can measure it with relatively high precision and accuracy. So now imagine this, right? So if you were to go and get an assay to measure an individual protein, and it was to cost $100, and now if you want to get, if the doctor wanted to measure 10 of those, it's going to cost $1,000. So now we're able to measure 63 all in one assay for the cost of doing one. So this is the way we think that a lot of um, assays will go in the future. They won't be measuring one protein at a time. They'll be measuring many proteins at a time, and it ultimately will reduce the cost dramatically. So one way in which we say how good an assay is is our coefficient of variance, and so most of these things are less than 20% variance. And so our assays generally are still in these upper regions, but still they represent a lot of very important proteins that are important in the cell. And now I also want to kind of point out another point, too, and that is if we can measure lots of proteins at once and we can do it inexpensively, uh, then we, we probably will think a little bit differently about the way uh, we think about um, what levels of proteins or levels of molecules are, um, uh, are important or dangerous. So one example is uh, getting your cholesterol measured. So a lot of us go to the doctor and we get our cholesterol measured and we will be told something like this. You'll be given a region where you say, look, you know, you want to keep it, you know, under 220, ideally under, under 200. And this is largely because if they go and you select a population of people, um, uh, that of everybody who gets their, their cholesterol measured, there is a distribution. And uh, you want to stay within a given region of that distribution. And so you may have a level that's extremely low, and that's going to be very good, and you, know, you could also have a level that's very high. But what we happen to know is that different people, based on their genetic backgrounds, have different levels just naturally. And what would probably be more important is actually is to know for you yourself and you and your family, what is your distribution levels. And so if you were to measure your cholesterol every single day for your life, you'd be able to have a distribution. And what we end up doing is we go to this yearly snapshot. And it's basically a way of thinking about this is that you end up, it's like watching a movie, but one frame at a time, and you step through at you know, random intervals throughout the, the movie. So if you're going to go and you see, you're only going to get 20 frames of a movie and they're randomly selected across the entire film, you wouldn't get a very good picture of what the movie is going to be like or what it's going to be about. In our case, um, 
I think the same thing's true in measuring different biomarkers or different markers of disease. So in summary, I think there's a lot that's kind of been uh, presented. So proteins are the, the primary biomolecules that carry out the function of the cell. They participate in every process within cells. To understand biology, um, you have to have tools that can measure proteins. Um, I would say that we have, or are having better and better tools every day, but they're still not perfect. Uh, we must be able to make these measurements more than one at a time. There's a lot of proteins to measure, and, uh, and they're very complicated, and they have lots of different physical chemical properties. Measuring proteins uh, in general is complicated. We don't have a one-size-fits-all approach. So uh, you measure um, one method that works one for one set of proteins won't necessarily work for, for another set of proteins. Uh, protein measurements in plasma have to be performed many at a time. Um, and we've made a lot of technological progress, um, and I would say that we, we also have to, to make more. So um, I would say, you know, people often ask me, uh, always are we kind of at this, this kind of this stumbling block? And, and I would say that we, we've got a lot of potential in, uh, measuring proteins and proteomics. Uh, we just need to solve uh, some more technical challenges. And this is basically what our lab here in genome sciences is focused on. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you.